and welcome to Fresh Dialogue. I'm Allison Van Dickelen, talking to you from Silicon Valley, California. Fresh Dialogues is an interview series with a green focus. I would like to thank you for being on Fresh Dialogues today. It's my pleasure. Your company is very strong on both environment and economy. You know, it's mentioned a lot mm -hmm. on your website. When you founded your company in 2001, which of the two was the main influencer for you? Actually, when I founded it in 2001, it was more of an escape from the internet to do something that I always really liked to do. And you know, my background in solar goes back to the late 70s when I was in college. And in the 70s, we had the energy crisis. And I think in 1977, Jimmy Carter gave that speech that the energy crisis is the moral equivalent of war. And that's when I first got interested in solar and did my, my solar research back in the 70s and it was because we had such an energy shortage and what's interesting back then is that there was no environmental consciousness about fossil fuels being bad nobody ever heard of greenhouse gases um, there was no such thing as global warming actually back in the 70s and 80s we were all worried about nuclear winter um, right. So maybe the combination of the two will moderate the, the climate, but you know who knows. So it was more energy independence was, then. That was the it was energy independence. And so then when I started uh, Akina in 2001, it was, gee, looks like photovoltaics um, are becoming affordable again, or for affordable for the first time. There may be a market. Let me put it on my house, and then I, I put a website together. And and when I started crunching through the economics with the combination of the rebates in California, the lowering equipment costs, and most importantly, the really high electric rates in California, the economics penciled out pretty well for people who were in a higher rate tier. Right. And so it was all based around the economics, and um, you know, but it was, it was a very feel-good kind of thing because we knew we were doing the right thing for the environment, and so we, we got people who were interested in both. Um, the, at the end of the day, the general customer response is that they want to do it for the environment or they want to do it for our country's energy independence, but if the numbers don't pencil out, they almost never do it. Some right. people are still hardcore, they'll do it, but generally you've got to make a decent economic so case. So his pocketbook is number one decision maker today? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I'm curious to know, I mean, there have been a lot of surveys out, Gallup polls and whatnot, mm -hmm. about people not believing or believing less, fewer people believing in global warming and having that impetus. Has that changed your sales pitch? Not at all. Right. No, I mean, it's, it, and the reason is that we never really directed our sales pitch exclusively towards environmental benefits. Right. It was always kind of combined. And, and one of the reasons for that is we learned early on that some people are, are very interested in, and concerned about global warming and it's at the top of their mind. And other people, they don't believe it. And it's like a religious thing. Right. So we, what was kind of interesting is we went back and when we, when we picked the color scheme for our vehicles and our company, um, a lot of people in the company said, well, you know, it should be green because we're a green company. And we were kind of talking to our customers and we realized that, you know, that works really well in the Bay Area. But if you kind of go outside the Bay Area and we had operations in Fresno and we had operations, you know, even further east in New Jersey, mm -hmm. it, you know, that it wasn't important. And they'd actually, customers would avoid a company whose, whose main pitch was green. Why where, was that? Because these people don't believe in global warming. Right. So and, green and meant, what, hippie to them or, or what no, exactly? Th th it was a religious thing. Green right. meant, oh, you must be one of those crazy companies or people that believe in global warming. I don't believe in global warming, therefore I'm not going to buy your product. Right. Okay. But so you would it, lose some market and you lose it. green. But if you hit them with the economic argument and the energy independence argument, it's like, oh, yeah, solar's the greatest thing. We don't need to buy any oil from you know, the Persian Gulf and I can be independent. And you know maybe the car should be red, white, and blue in that case. So we ended up doing everything in yellow and black, and it worked out fine. Okay. And going back to these days, just after MIT, and you said you worked for a couple of solar companies in the mm -hmm. Boston area. Yeah. And then everything went into hibernation with solar. Exactly. What's to stop that happening again? Well, the, it's, it's interesting. The cause of the hibernation was because the energy crisis was an economic issue. Gas prices went through the roof, oil prices went way up, 
Um, we, we created a solar incentive program. We created a Sin Fuels Corporation. We did all these things for, for producing clean ener for producing energy. Not, mm -hmm. not, it was oh, clean, had nothing to do energy. with it. Mm -hmm. and, and what happened is um, by, by the late by, by the late 70s, early 80s, when Ronald Reagan came in, and I think when, when Iran released the hostages and we were no longer kind of at war there, oil prices went down. Mm -hmm. And they didn't go down like that, but they went down kind of gradually over a few year period, and then the crisis went away. There was no more energy crisis. So the, the rebates for solar uh, were, were eliminated, the tax credits went away, and there was just kind of no more market, except for some hardcore people still in California and except for some people kind of who were doing off-grid stuff, but it just kind of went away. And it was sad because these companies just couldn't raise any money and, and the demand for the product wasn't so there. So what's to stop that happening again? The only thing that, I mean, the, if energy prices suddenly plummeted again. Oil prices specifically. Oil prices, gas prices, it, it'll happen again. It's kind of natural. We don't have the, the political will to artificially support oil prices or gas prices. Um, but what's, what's also happened now is that the worldwide demand for oil and gas is so high um, and the supply is generally limited. I mean, we're, we're at peak oil or past that. Um, just because of supply and demand, it's unlikely that we're going to suddenly find you know, an enormous new quantity of oil around the world and that's gonna, that supply is going to overwhelm the demand that we have in the U.S. and China and India and throughout the rest of the world. So I think economics is is going to reduce the chances that it will happen again. It being horrors, energy prices, fossil fuel prices going down, um, but it's not impossible. Well, Barry Cinema and I wish you the best, and thank you very much for talking on Fresh Dialogues today. All right, today. my pleasure, Allison. Okay. It's a great interview. Thank you. Check out freshdialogues.com for interviews with Paul Krugman, Martin Sheen. Tom Friedman, and many others.